Hey. Welcome, everybody. This is not a session. This is a game show. So get ready. All right. So this is uh, Chopped, the design system edition. You guys are familiar with the program on the Food Network. It is essentially a, a game show where they have uh, a series of chefs and they have uh, requirements that they have to fulfill to create each course. Uh, in our game, we have a design system that will function essentially as our pantry of ingredients. And we have a couple designer chefs with us, one online, one here in person, who will then compete to see who can deliver the best design pages out of this design system. So really quickly, my name is Matthew Dichter. I am the director of the experience design team at FFW. I manage a team of UX researchers, content designers and strategists, and visual designers to help build engaging experiences for all of our clients. Now, the rules here in Design Tournament Kitchen. Each round, well, we're only going to have one round because we timed this out earlier, and we only have time for one round. <laughs> but uh, uh, each round, our designer chef contestants will compose a new page based on that basket of requirements. They're going to have access to a pantry of ingredients. That's the design system. And make their pages uh, in uh, the timed round. And then at the end of the round, our judges here, uh, and our, we have a guest celebrity judge, in fact, with us, uh, will evaluate each submission uh, and choose which uh, design uh, failed to make the cut and which design uh, has become the chop champion here. All right, so let's meet our celebrity judges. The first one, uh, Mr. Brad Frost here from Big Medium. <laughs> uh, Brad's the author of Atomic Design, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, also a Pittsburgh resident. Uh, he's a design system consultant, web designer, developer, speaker, and writer. Really honored to have him here with us. Give him another big round of applause, please. <laughs> All right. Joining us, we also have uh, from FFW, uh, solutions architect, Ryan Price. <laughs> and from Princeton University, Jessica Monaco. Right. And alongside me, I have my colleague, Amanda Knopko. She is the uh, lead of content design practice at FFW. And uh, before we get started, we thought we'd give you a quick overview of design systems. So Amanda? Awesome. Can everyone hear me all right through this mask? Yes. Awesome. OK. So design systems serve as a complete set of standards. Um, they help you manage design at scale and they use elements, patterns, and reusable components to help build out that system. Um, makes it really easy for you to spin up content and also build over time. Um, it's a combination of your different design assets, your style guides, your usage guidelines. It could be code snippets as well. We'll give you some tools um, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, that you could possibly use to help manage that. And the benefits of design systems are really that you are able to deliver consistent on-brand experiences across all of your touch points. It's not just going to be your website. You could be using a design system for kind of multiple digital touch points that you're managing. It also helps to decrease your maintenance and unintended design and technical debt. It does help you save time and money. Um, and it does position you for maturity in your organization. So if you have a design system, you're able to kind of build out pages on your sites or within your different digital touch points quickly, um, push that content out. And then also you're able to take a look at how to grow and expand upon that system over time. So you've got a basis and then you can build and add new kind of snowflake type of um, components in. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Amanda. Um, and let's also talk a little bit about design system evolution. I think a lot of you in the room are probably familiar with the term design system, but we've found in our experience that uh, the name and the term design system can be applied to a lot of different, let's say, flavors 
Um, and so uh, this slide here really kind of gives us an overview of how a design system can ultimately mature all the way to something that is a, you know, design system that's fully integrated, uh, you know, and intended to be shared with a big, wide audience, usually something like a, a Nike design system or a Facebook design system, where the intent is that many, many different vendors or maybe even third party, you know, organizations or businesses want to start building off of that design system to make, you know, components or applications or software for that, you know, platform or universe. Amanda mentioned different tools that we leverage. Uh, for our game show today, we're gonna be using Figma as a way to kind of show off our design system and allow our design chefs to compete. Uh, but we also use other tools uh, in the course of our work. Amanda, you wanna talk about some of these? Awesome, yes, Matt. Um, so <clears throat> for our tools, as Matt mentioned, you know, there's, there's kind of a crawl, walk, run phase to design systems, as you just saw on the last slide. Um, and some of these tools are going to be more in that walk phase. Some of these tools are going to be more in that run phase. Um, and then Figma can be used as that kind of crawling stage where maybe you don't have full documentation um, around your design system, but you at least have the design system base. Um, and there are tools like zero height, um, like view design system that really lets you annotate around what your components are, what your templates are, how your content should be filled in and used, um, and how the system should be used overall. And then there's also ways to document um, code snippets and from the development side as well. I'm sure you guys have used Storybook before. We um, use that a lot. Uh, but that is basically a way to isolate and streamline the UI development and be able to test quickly your new components, um, be able to build those out and really test the content that's going into them and make sure that nothing is breaking. All right. Now that we've uh, gotten that quick overview of design systems, let's get into the competition. <laughs> so first and foremost, we have our design pantry. This is our Figma file. In that Figma file, each contestant will have access to the same design system. That design system is going to include eight page templates, 23 different components, and one page builder. Uh, within that design system itself, we have an array of different templates, components at the page level, and just global components that make up the complete design system. Uh, our contestants will have the opportunity to use and leverage any one of these templates or components uh, to create uh, the new page that we need created today. So, let's go ahead and meet our contestants. First and foremost, we have Amanda. <laughs> and also, joining us uh, remotely, let's see if I can get him over here, but uh, Mr. Graham, are you there? Hang on, let's see, hang on. Hold on, we gotta plug in our audio. Let's see, let's see if we can get this. All right, hello. John, can you hear us? Yes, I can. All right, hey. we can hear you. All right. All right. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is John Graham. He's joining us from the great state of uh, Minnesota. And uh, he will be competing as our other uh, contestant here today. Thank you for joining us, John. John's a designer <laughs> at SF Chip. All right. Let's get back to the presentation here. And so we have a nonprofit that we work with. They are called FFW, Feline Friends Worldwide. <laughs> we love cats around here, and we're, we're very fond of them. Uh, but this nonprofit, which, you know, has been around for a while, um, they have a massive new campaign that they want to launch. And they like their website and they have a lot of great pages and usually and definitely they have templates and components that can allow them to promote this event. But what they want to create is really special and they really feel like they need to make a big splash and have more of like a campaign landing page type of experience for this event. So in order to help raise awareness for this special event and raise money, and get volunteers to participate. 
our contestants are tasked with creating a new campaign landing page to promote the recruitment of volunteers for that event. The landing page will need to do the following. Provide event information. Recruit event volunteers. Showcase the event experience and ultimately collect volunteer contact information. All right. Well, we're going to give the contestants 10 minutes on the clock <laughs> to start designing. If you all will share your screens, we can drop in and look at what you guys are working on and doing. Uh, and while you do that, oh, thank you. Who are we looking at now? That's this John. is John. So we're looking at John's yet. screen. John's got the uh, Figma file open. And before we do that, I'm actually going to share my screen for a second. <laughs> so I can walk you guys through as they get started a little bit. Um, essentially, what um, what's in our design system? Let me pull that up. So as I had mentioned before, we have our Figma file here. Um, and um, in our design system for FFW, we've uh, called it the Meow Design System. Uh, it's, you know, like I said, it's uh, fairly mature. We have eight page templates, you know, over, you know, 20 components. Uh, we've taken our Figma file and we've broken it down uh, into a way that's kind of easy to get through uh, and a little bit orderly. Uh, this makes it uh, a bit uh, more simple for people to kind of find the exact uh, component or element that they might be looking for. So we've broken this down into what we call fundamentals. So these are kind of base components of the, of the system. So things like grids, colors, textiles, et cetera. Uh, and then we also go into uh, things that are like more global components. So something you might find across multiple pages like headers and footers or breadcrumbs, sub navigation. Uh, also, we have the whole set of reusable components. So all the different page elements that you might find. Things like hero banners and 50-50s. Uh, icon cards, info cards. You, know, you can see in here we have you know examples of both desktop and mobile. Uh, in some cases, we'll even show a lot of various iterations or variants uh, for those components as well. Um, so we have all sorts of components, and then we also like to show how these components start to come together in certain templates. So in this case, we have a home page template, a section landing page template. Let's do a little zooming in for you guys. Um, some basic content pages. Nice. Uh, we have an events landing page, an events detail page. So there we go. Uh, we also have included uh, a page builder. Uh, this is essentially a way for us to do some work programmatically in Figma. It actually allows uh, our designers or people who even aren't as comfortable with designer Figma to have a drag and drop type of experience. So they can essentially just take components and add them to the page and they'll be ordered and spaced properly using things like auto layout uh, within Figma itself. Uh, so that is the overview of the design system. So those are actually the pages and the components that our current contestants are working with right now. Uh, so let me uh, start to kind of drop in on people's screens a little bit. So let's uh, let's poke in and see what Amanda's doing. Amanda's uh, currently uh, digging through. Looks like uh, she's going through, uh, checking out what available components there are. Um, they also have been given within this file an additional page that has all the campaign requirements on it. So they have copy ready to go. They have some imagery that they can use. That's essentially like the creative brief that they may have gotten uh, before starting on this uh, work. So that's Amanda working on it. Looks like she's uh, building out a form. And let's uh, let's see what uh, John's doing right now. Oh, John's, uh, John's working on the hero right now. Um, it'll be interesting to see as this all comes together, essentially how they choose to even prioritize the types of content on the page, right? They have access to the same level of components, the same uh, mix of templates, but it'll be interesting to see, I think, what their interpretation of the requirements are and what they felt might be, from a content design perspective, the more important the things to put at the top of the page. Or even more interestingly, you know, you saw that we had a lot of different components um, and you know, a lot of the information that they're working with could probably be expressed through multiple different components. And in some cases, it's like 
a decision that the designer or the content designer might have to make as to what is the best component available to best express this idea and convey that to the, to the audience. Um, so I uh, just you know, wanted to kind of talk a little bit to our uh, celebrity judges over here. During CHOP, there's usually some banter while the chefs are kind of <laughs> cooking and <laughs> making their work happen. Um, so uh, just uh, kind of really quickly, I think I want to start with um, kind of talking um, about uh, jobs to be done. Uh, jobs to be done is a term we like to use when we're trying to understand what users need to accomplish on a given website. So oftentimes we will do uh, workshops with our clients during our discovery phases where we'll talk, start to talk about the different users of the websites and the specific things that they've come to the website to do. That allows us to populate what we call our jobs to be done list. And these jobs to be done, you know, essentially made their way into this exercise right here. Those requirements that you saw at the beginning essentially are the jobs to be done for the people who want to volunteer and attend this event. Um, so that's kind of one of the interesting things that's uh, going on here. Um, another thing that I um, wanted to also talk about is that you know, we have this design system. We do have these options for, um, for the designers to kind of use like off the shelf. But oftentimes, that all those elements that are there aren't exactly everything that you might need. And we like to say that a design system isn't intended to be just a rigid set of requirements that you are forced to live within. It's actually a good jumping off point. It's something to build off of, to innovate and iterate on. And uh, you know, Brad, I think you bring up a, a great point in a lot of the work you do where you talk about this distinction between things that may be inherited into a design system and then something that you call a snowflake. Can you talk a little bit about a snowflake? Yeah, I'll take I'll take it a step further. We got recipes in the mix, right? It's a, a kind of a phrase we use a fair amount, but I think that you're right. Where where basically a design system isn't meant to contain literally every single piece of a UI, and I think that that's where like a lot of teams get trapped is that they see it as these are the only colors you could paint with, which just isn't true. And I think that. It's helpful, especially for kind of more marketing experiences like this. It's important to be able to have the the ability and the flexibility to to create what you need to create. But it's it's important to so it's so it's helpful to to kind of differentiate between things that are really kind of like low level meat and potatoes, the kind of boring stuff, right? Like the buttons and the text fields. Please, for the love of God, don't don't. <laughs> innovate on text fields like don't do that there's tons of other areas to innovate right things like heroes and stuff like that's okay it's splashier marketier maybe knock yourself out but use those buttons use those sort of form fields so the more sort of atomic elements might make sense to like live in the design system proper but then there could be these kind of you're calling them global global components I kind of call those like recipes right like a global header for this website might be different than the global he header for another maybe internal facing site for the same organization, right? So, so the ingredients of that global header might be contained in the design system, but that specific composition, right, might actually be a recipe that's sort of specific to a given product. So sort of having this kind of almost like layer cake approach to design systems where some things that are meant to be truly shared across an organization make sense to live in the design system layer, but then there's kind of layers that can sit on top of it that can sort of be shared within like a smaller sphere. Thank you, Brad. And I think that uh, that actually, I think is close to some of the challenges that you might deal with, Jessica, at uh, Princeton, uh, because you have probably a lot of different constituents these groups within sure. the campus that you need to appease. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, our, our Princeton site builder system that we've created over the past several years, uh, we have uh, roughly a thousand sites in this in the system. And in academia, we love snowflakes. That's <laughs> one of our favorite spaces to work in. So we're very we're very familiar with all of the site owners um, and kind of looking at these these goals that you're talking about, these jobs to be done and. We do a lot of uh, teaching of the teachers <laughs> um, and really showing them that the site is not for them, but they're building for their users. And 
getting them to identify and build to those goals and then create and use those components uh, across all the sites that we can share. Um, it can still look unique to them, but the, the base is, is um, common underneath, which, which helps our maintenance when we you have a very small team, which is what we do, so. Awesome, thank yeah. you. And Ryan, I mean, you, you're probably involved in doing a lot of the training, or at least training adjacent stuff when it comes to the CMS implementation and the people who have to operate it. Yeah, definitely. So one reason why I got involved with the solutions team in the first place is to you know, be more involved in the processes that are helping people decide what to build or what not to build, as it were. And um, one thing I think is interesting is that we use this word jobs to be done when we're talking about these. We're, we don't necessarily always talk about user stories because a user story seems to be like something that will take me three seconds to do versus a job to be done might be something that could take me three weeks to do. There's, there's a lot of like more scope when you stop thinking about it as like a distinct thing that happens when I push this button. It's, it's more about a thing that I want to accomplish as the user of the site. And um, you know, coming back to what you're saying about like training people on how to use things, it really means that the 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 people that are you know carrying out the the content creation activities and the content management activities, they need to understand why the user is coming here so that they can direct them to to achieve their entire purpose on this site, not just to like make this button look good. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so our designers are still plugging away. We're, we're checking out Amanda's screen right now. She's currently working on a little uh, full row, you know, CTA here about volunteering. Drop, it, drop in and see what uh, John's up to. Looks like John's got his page pulling together, trying to move some things around here. All right, we'll keep moving along, and I'll keep bantering as they go. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that um, I found um, challenging um, from the agency side is that, you know, when we do a design system, um, we there's there's a lot that goes into the work in terms of ultimately delivering and handing off that design system. But I think we've touched upon a little bit is uh, th one of the other challenges is the adoption of that design system from the team that we've handed off. Um, Again, we do a lot of client work, so you know that's usually when our job stops at times, that we've delivered this thing, we've put this out in the universe, and now we gotta kind of like hope and you know that uh, this thing will be utilized in the future and then properly kind of governed and managed. Um, we've, um, we've seen a lot of different models uh, around how uh, organizations choose to govern uh, their design system. Um, oftentimes, um, it is just, you know, an inherited responsibility of a person on the, you know, web development team or web design team of that group. Uh, in other cases, it's a shared responsibility between our team at FFW and the, the counterpart. It's, it's in those cases where we found we've been most uh, successful, uh, only because um, it allows uh, people who are not necessarily focused on the day-to-day -day of governing a design system, you know, having to take on that responsibility on top of all the other work that they have to do. Uh, but really, um, one of the things that we're, we're really focused on is trying to not just deliver the design system, but then help better socialize the design system around these organizations. And so that means really taking the time to do some marketing yourselves of trying to convince the people who might be using the design system or being able to leverage it, uh, the actual effectiveness that it would have for them and what they want to accomplish. Um, all right, so how are you guys doing? Amanda? <laughs> how much time do we have left? <laughs> <laughs> Let's check the clock. Hang on this second. is a stressful situation. You got another five minutes on the clock here. Okay, five minutes to yeah. save the cats, great. <laughs> five minutes to save the cats. Fantastic. All right, so um, while they, while they have uh, five minutes to keep designing, I wanted to see if anybody out here in the crowd had any uh, questions at all. Yes, sir. So I refer to FFW as the Association of Development Agencies, not the <laughs> Design 
So how much time did it take for us to pull this specific example together? Um, well, actually, we used an existing design system uh, because that's part of the point of this exercise almost, like how do we build on what we have versus you know, creating all these things net new. Um, it was probably you know a good amount of time. I'm gonna guess ballpark. You know maybe we spent like <laughs> we probably spent like you know a week pulling together all the things for this session. Um, but again, like the design system that we're using uh, is based on a design system we had done for another nonprofit. Um, fairly standard in terms of the types of templates that we would generally have to create, the types of components that we would need, and knowing that we had to put something together for this session instead of creating something completely new, we thought, okay, well, how do we create you know, a, a world around this example that would work for everybody? And who doesn't like cats? So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, over here. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I would say um, in most cases we are creating kind of design systems that are somewhat new. Uh, they could be, they might be based on some existing platforms design system as like a kind of base layer before we start iterating and building on top of that. Um, in other cases, a lot of the work that we're doing oftentimes are uh, essentially like replatforms, right? So a client is coming to us, they need to upgrade their technology stack, and they say, well, we might as well take, make that investment in the design as well. So oftentimes what we have to do is actually take an existing website, then we have to essentially reverse engineer that into a design system where we go through and we identify all the different components that exist, all the foundational elements, anything that would possibly make up the UI or could ultimately make its way into a design system. And then from there, we would ultimately come up with that well, what is that next kind of equivalent of that? So it's in some sense taking that design system that should exist, right, and kind of creating one to ultimately then build on top of that. And I, I can throw a little bit more in here. I would say this, this act of like breaking down the site that already exists can take weeks. Um, we had a site where there were identified, I think it was like 110 components and we were trying to get it down to 20. So there's, there's definitely calculus that has to happen when you're trying to decide like, what things do we think of as more like a snowflake or what things do we want to say like, well, these two things are similar enough that we're going to try to treat this as a building block versus something that you know, um, will be existing far in the future you know, as it's its own special thing. Over here? Um, in general, uh, when like content strategy hires get into code off the top, is that when they're kind of sticky to one point, to the point where you're talking about content, or is there the risk being that like, you're creating these generic containers and they're like, what's going to go in them? Uh, or is it generally like you kind of circle back to the top that you were talking with the content flow for people? So I think that's just how they work. I think slightly truthfully is while I also try and design on the fly well, here. Well, it's, it's, honestly, we make Amanda multitask like this yeah. all the time. So this is like part of the daily. Um, generally, what we do is we will go through like a discovery process in which we're trying to figure out what the content that you need is in order to fit the components to that content. Now, we're going to have reusable components that come out of that for more generic content, that's kind of what you're seeing here today. Um, but then we are going to have lots of structured components around very specific content types and very specific content needs. Um, and we do structure that at the beginning and we kind of continue throughout the entire design phase because as everyone knows, once you see something in color and <laughs> in a visual, things may change. We may wanna change that content model up. Um, so we do our like IA around our site mapping and our general like conceptual content modeling, and then um, we build out our templates and our components from, from there. 
All right, way back there. Back to design. Uh, yeah, I think I can answer this one a few different ways. Uh, one is I think it's still almost a struggle in some sense in terms of naming convention, especially because we have a lot of different documents and artifacts that are happening to get us to the design system, and we have a lot of different teams working on stuff. And so one of the things that we found is almost that we have to do some level of like reconciliation at the end of our projects to make sure we're all on the same page as to what we're calling a component, because a component in a Figma file might have been referred to a little differently in, uh, you know, in the development system, or a little differently in Confluence when someone referred to it, or even like once it makes its way into a CMS, and it's like maybe even labeled something differently there. So we're trying to keep a much better eye on uh, like a very consistent naming conventions there. Um, one of the things that um, also affects like how we approach that is also the complexity of the of the design system itself. Uh, there are right now numerous ways that we can handle variations of a given component or UI element from having design tokens, which allow you to kind of have these more global settings that can affect the UI, to uh, you know just having a variation of, oh, this thing should have an extra button, a secondary button. Um, and so um, there's, I guess, ultimately a lot of different ways that a team could decide what the best approach is. I think the most critical thing is that it's a consistent uh, naming convention that's happening that the team has agreed upon before getting started and ultimately it's one that makes like n not just like machine sense but like human sense for ultimately the people who are going to be responsible for having to use this design system edit in the future make sense of you know what some of these terms mean. I think we could all agree that naming things is really easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's the easiest part of this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brad, did you? Yeah, it, it's a great question. And uh, one of the things that we hear a lot is like design systems are killing creativity, right? Just all the time. And like, and with all due respect to this, it's like, you know, these are like kind of standard fair marketing components. It's all good, right? Like it's, it's doing its job. It's like very meat and potatoes, but like, yeah, where's the freaking cat walking across the screen? Or like, is there opportunity for some razzle dazzle there? Right. And, and I think that that's where it's, it's important to start with, and I love how you guys did it of, of starting with those jobs to be done and really sort of starting with the goals of the, of the the page right that's the job of the 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 product designer is to create the best product period right and then there's there's a natural tension with reusability and holistic thinking and does a scale to other solutions and stuff like that and so there's the a kind of a, a yin and yang that sort of happens where you sort of have to balance that tension between sort of just doing things that are totally bespoke and sort of you know building for radical reuse right and again there's like a time and a place for everything so it's like I, I like to say that it's good to have like hero components and we have those here and and some uh, some sort of like marketing sections that are like you know kind of nice chunky center aligned kind of things that's all good that's good meat and potatoes stuff but then yeah maybe that top of the page above the fold thing is the area for razzle dazzle and maybe that doesn't live in the design system right but like it's not an all or nothing thing and i think that that's like the the trap that people fall into is that it's like 
you must use the design system or you must reject it and go it alone. And it's really not that simple, right? It's, it's like kind of innovate where innovation is appropriate and use the system where you shouldn't be innovating. Again, form fields, please, for the love of God, <laughs> if there's one thing you take from me from this panel, don't innovate on form fields. Like that's not the place for it, right? Make the cat walk across the screen instead. And if, if I can come at it from implementation land too, I think sometimes it comes down to budget. Um, you know, like we need to achieve all of these features inside of X amount of time and X amount of money. And we can make allowances for, you know, this one big splash or this other big splash. And if you say, well, this is for the annual report, then I might say, well, when does the annual report come out? Next May. Let's put that in phase two. I don't want you to not get your creative, um, awesome cat walking across the screen, but it might not be a good idea for, for you know, step one. Um, I think a good example of this, uh, there's some work we're doing for one of our clients, um, Hologic, where we've you know, built a, a large website for them and um, they also uh, have a handful of other initiatives. Hologic is a medical uh, diagnostics and device company. Uh, and uh, they also uh, produce uh, this thing called the Global Women's Health Index, which is essentially a global census on women's health, where they interview women in over 200 different countries or something. I can't remember the exact amount, but it's hundreds of countries uh, where they're interviewing women and getting a, a sense of you know, what the health for women is like in these countries. Uh, in terms of building a site to support the report that comes out every year that they deliver with Gallup, um, we needed to stand up a website. Now we had a design system that had most of the things that we could possibly need to convey the things in the report. We had media galleries, we had article pages, we had you know little CTAs and cards and things that we could put like small little stats and icons in, but we had no real way to actually you know, do some powerful sort of data visualization or really interesting like storytelling on that website. So instead of them spending their money on just trying to build this, stand up a whole new report site from the bottom up, we leveraged the design system that we had for Hologic. And then we spent all that time, invest all the money, creating all the new things. What are these new like data visualizations that we create? What are these new like infographics and animations that we can create? So having this design system allowed us to unlock all this creative potential to ultimately figure out new ways to express this information. So I think that's a good way to kind of demonstrate how having this design system wasn't a limiter for us to build out that data visualization site. It was actually that foundation that allowed us to accomplish it. I, I would also like to point out, um, it links back to your content question that was asked earlier. Um, a lot of times we spend a, a lot of time up front talking about the, the content strategy and working out the information architecture. And um, we like to create outlines uh, of just text of the content and the goals of a particular page. And that's when my designer works with my strategist and they figure out which pieces of content fit into the components that we have and which ones really deserve that creativity. And sometimes it means going back to the site owner and saying, you know, let's think about your content in a more creative way. You can deliver this message with just a picture and a, a paragraph, but maybe there's something more engaging here that we could put um, to really call out something exciting that's happening within a, within a particular site or organization that they want to communicate. So really partnering design and content um, is just as, you know, you think about the, the development part at the end, but you've always got to link back to what that content message is, and that's where you want to find that, those creative opportunities. I think just to add on that, I think that that's great. And, and that story is fantastic as well. We, one of the things that we like to sort of say is that the design systems aren't the place to innovate, right? The design systems are there to kind of capture solved problems, right? So in our work, we, you know, we work with a bunch of jumbo size organizations with, you know, hundreds of scrum teams, thousands of scrum teams, like kind of all sort of milling away at their corners of the, of the universe, doing great product design, doing great development work and all of that. And the, the role of the design system is there to sort of capture the things that are, have proven out in, in products, right? As, oh, wow, this, this is, 
really converted well, right? You know, oh, this is a really sort of novel solution to a hard problem. And those are the kinds of things that sort of get curated into the design system and becomes an ingredient to kind of feed back out, right? So we, we tend to think of these things as different pace layers. It's, in, it's interesting, you, you're all kind of talking through the lens of like specific websites a lot. It's like, it, in our work, it's like we've, we're like kind of out of that product layer entirely. We kind of treat them as separate pace layers where product is moving at its own often very fast pace. And then the job of the design system is there to intentionally move at a slower pace, right? More of a, of a sort of a nuanced and, you know, again, sort of it's, it's curating things that are happening elsewhere in, t in pulling it into the, to a, uh, a central place to serve as institutional knowledge. All right. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, everybody. Ding, 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 ding. Yes. <laughs> Time's up. Need music. All right. So, all right. Uh, pencils down or cursors down. I don't know. Um, all right. So just to reset for everybody, uh, we had two contestants, Amanda and John. They had to build a campaign landing page um, based on this design system. And um, let's see. Uh, we'll... We'll make the guy on the phone go first. So, John, I'm going to ask you to, uh, well, you, you are sharing your screen. So uh, if you want to go ahead and take it away. All right, you got it. So here we've got Pause Across America 2023 with some, some details about when and where it happens and, and a little bit of a brief summary about Pause Across America. We've got uh, a nice little stats section talking about how holding pause helps. John, could you just um, zoom in a little bit? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank you. There we go. Where is it? Nope. Need it. A call to action for making the yeah. world a perfect my place to mic. become a blog. Oh, oh sorry. You know what? I'm. It's the problem exists right here. <laughs> uh, all right, John. I'm sorry. Take it from the top, will you? I apologize. Oh yeah. So here we've got Pause Across America 2023 up at the top, uh, talking about. Uh, where and when it'll happen, and a little bit of a brief summary about uh, the Pause Across America event. We've got a little bit of a stats section here that talks about how many participants we've got, how many dollars have been raised, how many miles are covered. We've got our call to action, uh, giving people a little bit of a, a teaser information and telling them how to become a volunteer. Clicking that link will take people down to the, the lovely form that we've got at the bottom. We've got an informational section here that talks about how many paws are needed in order to cross America <laughs> and all of these cats going across the cross and die. <laughs> We've got uh, how does volunteering work, talking about all the tools that you get as a volunteer, forms and templates, training materials, et cetera. And we've got some Paws Across America events, uh, along with the hot air balloon ride in New Mexico, <laughs> cat herding demonstration, and some live bands at organizational centers. And speaking of live bands, we've got the musical stylings of Whisker Jam, Perfect Hog, <laughs> Meow Team, et cetera. Uh, and on, we've got events for Pause Across America 2023, testimonials, talking about all of the cats who have been saved, and a nice little form awesome. telling you how you can become a volunteer. Awesome, great. Thank you, John. And I did. Yes, yeah, give them a round of applause. Thank you, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so John, I did notice uh, one of the elements in there was not like something I recall seeing from the design system. This one here? Yeah, yeah I just kind of uh, put that together on the fly. Nice, <laughs> all right. Um, because we didn't have a cat band component, I assume. <laughs> so. Awesome, exactly. thank you. All right, all right, well, let's, uh, let's pass it over to Amanda. Let me get the screen share right this time. All right, Amanda, take it away. Okay, let me pull this over. So at the top here, we've got some information about the event. This would include information of where the event is, what time, also to see more event details, and that volunteer now would bring you down to the form that's all the way at the bottom. We've got some information about the event. So some of the things that you saw in John's in those different cards, I've chosen to use these icon cards to highlight those instead. 
Next, we talk about the experience so far, so trying to get people hyped about possibly volunteering. Um, this is my personal cat, so <laughs> 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 gotta call out Chomp. Next, we have information on why volunteer, um, and then leading you off to a landing page that has more information about volunteering. Again, some information about the event, what we've accomplished so far. If you've gotten this far down the page, you're thinking about volunteering, we wanna get you excited about all of the things that we've done so that you do wanna get involved. We also wanna tell you what our volunteers think about volunteering. And then at the bottom, we've got our volunteer now form. Awesome, all right, thank you, Amanda. Yeah. Side note, I noticed you guys both put the testimonial form at the bottom of the page, and I know this session isn't about that, but that's usually how people feel about them anyway, that, <laughs> <laughs> that they should be at the bottom of the page. That's a, that's a side note. Um, well, thank you. Thank you both. Um, so what I'd like to do is we're going to have the, the celebrity judges confer over here uh, and talk about <laughs> you know, what they've oh, seen. Right. But in the meantime, while they, while they do that, I would like to take a poll of the room. So let's, uh, by a round of applause. You're not going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> John is way quicker in Figma than I am. <laughs> so by uh, a round of applause, uh, you know, if you, if you prefer John's, uh, John, if you want to scroll to the top here. All right. So we have John's. Who likes John's? All right. <laughs> And Amanda, who likes Amanda's? Oh, wow. Oh, I'm so glad we have the celebrity judges here because this is obviously a tie based on what we have in the room. All right, so judges, have you conferred? No. no. Oh, oh, oh. You, need, you need to riff for like one more minute. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna riff for one more minute. Um, well, thank you all for coming and indulging us for this ridiculous session. I uh, hope you took something way out of it. You know, honestly, we really wanted to do a way to kind of talk about this stuff in just a more fun, engaging way. Um, you know, you guys uh, have been here all day. You got a few more days ahead of you with a lot of sessions. And so we just wanted to kind of liven up a little bit. So glad you guys could all attend and join us. And if you do have any additional questions, please feel free to grab anyone in a chef coat. But I can't guarantee they'll answer it. But yeah, uh, me too, though. I, I can help. So. Um, all right. They're still bantering. <laughs> yeah, I'll let them confer. Any uh, any last questions then? Uh, right there. Yep. In the checker chart. Generally, um, our developers will go into this file and they will kind of extract the CSS that they would like from it um, and then put it into something like Storybook where we can actually test on the fly in the environment in HTML and CSS if we like what's going on there and some of the responsiveness because as you know, you know, as you're doing responsive design, there's sometimes additional breakpoints that need to be added or things that need to be adjusted. So that really helps us, but moment. generally our developers <laughs> are yeah. um, very well versed in Figma. Um, yeah. We do leave annotations. Uh, this is a very yeah. bare bones design system that you saw. There were no annotations in here. Generally we break down the components into fields and also give any sort of yeah. spacing and colors and that sort of thing as well so that the developers have that readily available. This is definitely a lighter weight design system, as Amanda was saying. As you can see in Figma, Figma also has like inspect tools, sure. oh, yeah, so yeah, you can yeah. see like yeah, the yeah. CSS no, and stuff yeah, like that. Uh, but as yeah. she said, we we will also include uh, either directly in the Figma file, or if the client has chosen another um, platform to host the design system on, we'll usually capture annotations that are both you know functional, behavioral um, annotations that'll cover off for like a content editor, so they can understand how many objects belong in that thing or how many characters should go in that thing. Um, we will include annotations for, for developers um, and, uh, and also for designers in some cases as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Matt. You're pointing. 
Oh, yes. The, the great question. This has actually come up recently on some projects as well because um, as a designer, it's interesting. You look at something like a card, right? And you're like, oh, it's a card. It's got a picture. It's got an icon. It's got some text, a little UI element. Uh, but what's actually powering the information of that card can, can be completely different and actually change how you know, a team might even implement that as well. Right, exactly. And so um, you know, one of the things that you know, we'll definitely do is – you know, as we're designing out these components, either create a variation or otherwise, and annotate like whether you know the content here is maybe it's driven by a taxonomy or maybe the content is manually input or or otherwise. And we generally do that in our content models, um, which are separate spreadsheets that help with annotating, uh, because obviously if you're in Figma, you can't be annotating everything that you want to annotate in there. It's a little difficult. So we break it down by field in a spreadsheet and then note where that data is coming from, if it's coming from a PIM, if it's coming from um, an external source, if it's you know static or if it's dynamic content that needs to pull from another content type, that sort of thing. How do you pull them into spreadsheets? So generally we'll link off. Um, so yeah, so we'll link straight to the component or the page. That's why we set these up as pages on the side because it really helps to be able to link yeah. directly to those elements. Mm -hmm. And also sometimes we will have page level annotations that need to be understood and sometimes there's component level annotations. Like it's not you know rare for us to have some object on a page and your interaction with it affect like another object on the page as well. I think we have a decision. All right, I think we have a decision. <laughs> <laughs> Judges. Yeah, um, we have a little little feedback um, for for each of the contestants here. So, um, Amanda, we think you definitely achieved all the points of the brief uh, competently as well. And <laughs> um, I, I like I like the use of the icon cards because it allows you to get more flexible um, going forward. And um, you know, definitely, like some of the pictures that that John chose and the way he chose to like put photos, you know, uh, more centrally. I think that was cool too. But I have other judges may have other things to say. Amanda, I liked that you um, pointed out that the button at the top would take you directly down to the form for those folks who are really just interested in getting straight to the action item. Um, so I think that was a great a great plus on your part. Um, and you told the story very well uh, down the page. Um, I, I have to say that there's a lot of character um, added into the personality of John Sight, and so I want to give him kudos for that as well. Yeah, I think I think you both nailed the brief pretty pretty well. I think that yeah, <laughs> yes, Absol absolutely. I, I and and again, it's a, what's kind of fun is like seeing them side by side is like how the same ingredients can be sort of cobbled together and used in different ways to sort of tell different stories and and things like that. You sort of have, you know, some different variety, obviously some different page length as we're seeing here. <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll say that like, in my view, it's it's a draw with the, with the exception of I'm a sucker, I'm, I'm a musician. So, so John's uh, little sort of cat festival <laughs> snowflake is the, is the snowflake that, that wins me over, we'll say. So, but yes. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for everybody for attending. Thanks to our celebrity judges, our contestants, our hosts here at DrupalCon. Everybody have a great evening. Thank you all.